God, the beneficent, the merciful. May his peace and his blessings forever be upon his servant and his messenger, Muhammad, forever. Amen. And the greetings of all the prophets from Abraham to Muhammad, the greetings of peace, I greet you. Assalamu alaikum. First, I must say I really thank uh, the ministers, Aziz, uh, Minister Muhammad Abdullah, and Minister Naeem Akbar for the great delivery that they made here this afternoon and for the support, the genuine support that they give me in this office. Uh, it's kind of hard to get started once people have put you up so high, you know, and praised you so much. <laughs> but um, I don't feel that I deserve all that, but I know the office deserves all that, and even more. And when I speak of the office, I mean the <clears throat> mission that Almighty God has given us and the responsibilities that we are charged with it's worthy of all the praise that they gave it and even more. <clears throat> now, brothers and sisters, I have, well, many things I would like to say to you. I'll try to get to them as quick as possible. But I would like to do it as naturally as possible. Therefore, I don't want to rush into anything. Um, <clears throat> we have some dignitaries out here from the Latin Amer American community. And I want to thank them for their presence today. It's a bad day today. We have snow out there. This is our main meeting, our big meeting. We've had so many nice Sundays, and now on the fourth Sunday, when I come out here to see you and talk with you and have snow out there. Well, I hope it didn't stop anybody that's supposed to be here. <laughs> as long as it didn't stop anybody that's supposed to be here, then I'm all right. <clears throat> For the benefit of our honorable guests from the Latin American community. I want to say that, uh, tell you that when I speak on religion, I don't feel that I'm speaking as a Muslim in the sense that the world see and accept Muslims. I don't feel that I'm speaking as a Christian or as a Jew or as any particular religious society or uh, uh, people. I feel I'm speaking as one who believes in Almighty God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. And I have the right to speak and feel comfortable anywhere and with any people, because we all are one creation, and we all have one boss over us. <clears throat> the world has become so confused it is pretty hard to really identify Muslims and Christians or Jews. Muslims have stopped living like Muslims. Christians have stopped living like Christians. 
and Jews long time ago stopped living like Jews. That is like they are supposed to live. So uh, <clears throat> it's kind of a big problem when we try to put labels on each other and deal with labels. The matter is made simple when we ignore the labels and deal with the content. And that's what we want to do. We want to deal with the content. And the Holy Quran tells us, and we can plainly see that when we study the great religious, the great religions and the great religious movement, the Holy Quran tells us that the divine content is the same in all the great religions. The Holy Quran tells us again that the messengers, the prophets, and messengers of God, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, all of them, the Holy Quran tells us that they belong to one prophethood, to one. They were expecting, they preached and expected a Messiah, one like David, who would be brave enough to stand before the Romans, like little David stood before Goliath and by himself challenge the great Roman powers and defeat them with truth. But when Jesus came up and won such great acclaim among the people, they didn't, uh, that is, the leadership, the established uh, leadership of the Jews, those strong sects in Judaism. They didn't respect, they didn't recognize uh, Jesus. They didn't accept Jesus. Why? Because Jesus wasn't the kind of Messiah that they were looking for. Instead of Jesus doing what they thought he was going to do, or what they thought the Messiah would do, he did what they never expected. They were expecting him to stand up and condemn Rome. But he stood up and condemned his own people. He stood up and condemned the hypocritical Jews. They didn't want him. But Jesus knew he was wise and divinely guided. He knew that you have to do first things first. If a people has an enemy and oppressor over them and they can't do anything about their condition, they should first look at what's happening in their own hearts and minds. Because something has gone wrong within the community to make it possible for an oppressor to get a power, get power, power and a firm position over them. So Jesus went home at the real cause of the problem. He said, you lying, hypocritical Jews. You devils in disguise. All right. Now that man did a great work. He truly left the sign in history that a Savior was indeed born. He was a Savior. That's what it takes to save a people the courage to do a thing that they don't like, but that you know is good for them. How good would the doctor be if he would be concerned about the taste of his medicine? He wouldn't be good at all because most medicine tastes bitter in the mouth.
most of us, we hold our mind back. And we won't allow our divinely given mind, our conscience, to do right things for us. The book says that darkness would come upon the whole world. So Jesus' first appearance in Scripture is described as one coming under the cover of darkness in a dark time. A time when the earth was dark. That is, the society, the people were in darkness, the masses. But the leadership had light. See, the book speaks of two firmaments. And we have wrongly taken these firmaments to be earth and heaven, our physical earth and physical sky. The book is not talking about that. The book is talking about things that, are, that resemble in their nature In their purpose, they resemble physical earth and physical sky, but are not physical earth and physical sky. The book speaks of two firmaments, the lower and the upper. The lower one represents the ignorant people, the deprived, the rejected, the unschooled. And the upper firmament represents the favored. Those who were favored with knowledge and with wealth. And because of that, they have a position of power over the common people. Darkness is not on the earth, the masses 
the common people. They know what's right and know what's wrong. They have seen the wrongdoings of the leadership. The average person out there in the street can condemn the preacher who's lying right now maybe in his pulpit. Today, darkness is not on the face of the earth. Darkness is over the heaven. The average person right now in the street can condemn government leaders for their conduct. But there was a time a few centuries ago when the masses were so kept out of everything, before television, before literacy. <laughs> The masses were kept out of everything. And the people, the common lot, could not point a finger and judge those who were ruling over there. They had to contend with, they had to put up with whatever was put on them by the, by the leadership. But we have come to that time that the book will prophesy of, that there will come a time when the ground will be lit with knowledge. The common people out there, they have light. They know truth. They can't read the Bible because they were not given the Bible. They were given a, 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 a reason, a rational mind. And they were given an, an experience of centuries of, of enslavement and deprivation. And this experience has lit their mind. And the natural conscience that Almighty God gave them lights their heart. So they're not in darkness, but the church is in darkness. The synagogue is in darkness. The mosque is in darkness. And I speak as an eyewitness. I've been around the Jews. I've sit with them. I've been to Christian churches. I've sat with them. I've been in the mosques abroad. I have sat with them, and I know that darkness is upon the heavens today, but there is light on the earth. And what does the book say? What will happen to remove the darkness of the heavens? The book says that his coming will be as a flash of light out of the east, even unto the west. I will explain this, not by my own wisdom, but by what Almighty God has blessed us with. In order to remove the confusion in religion today, it is necessary to go back to where this religious teaching started and trace it up to where we are today. We have to bring it from Jerusalem to Chicago and not have a single break in the chain of life that stretch from Jerusalem to Chicago. That's what has to be done before the religious order today can be lit up again with light. Why? Because someone has broken up that chain of light. They separated Abraham from Moses, Moses from Jesus, Jesus from Muhammad. They have put blocks of darkness in the great chain of prophets in the movement of truth from God to us. And in order to see clearly again, we have to again see that light stretching from the east to the west in an even, unbroken pattern. So what does the book say? It says that Jesus will come. When he comes, he'll come to judge. He will come to condemn. He will come to reprove the righteous, to justify the righteous. He will come to satisfy the hearts and the minds, those burdened hearts and minds that have held on to truth and God, that have 
respected righteousness and humanity, but have suffered the greatest hell that any human being or any creature could be put in. He will bring comfort to their minds and to their hearts by explaining to them the thing that took place. And he will condemn the wicked. And who will the wicked be that he will condemn? They will be the same ones that he condemned before. That's why the return of this light is called Christ again. Because the job the man has to do is the same. He's not coming to chase common prostitutes and make them confess their sins. He's not coming to chase people who eat physical forbidden things. Those hog eaters who eat physical hog flesh. His return is not to chase them around and to make them confess their sins. He's not going to come pulling a finger down on earth. On his return, he does the same thing he did the first time he came. He points up at the heavens. The first time he came, came around, he pointed at the heavens, and he said, the earth is dark because the heaven is a hypocrite. Now, the second time he comes around, he says, the heaven is dark because of God's judgment. You were a hypocrite, so God took the light away from you and made your heavens dark. Now that's what I'm saying to you. That mosque, church, and synagogue have been hypocrites And the heavens are dark today because God has condemned them and taken the light away. He cut the light off in the synagogue and in the church and in the mosque because they didn't deserve to have his light shining up there in that so-called heaven. Oh, how can you speak that way? Look at the good Christians have done. Look at the good the devil has done. Look at the good the, 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 the mom has done. Again, I say, look at the good the devil has done. Do you think the devil is all bad? The devil always show more good than he show bad. But he produced more hell than he produced heaven. The Jews, the Christians, and the Muslims, they have shown more good than they have shown, shown bad. But the, the effect that they have left on the earth has been more hellish than it has been divine. Oh, I don't speak before I give it a lot of thought. And I don't speak before I look at what God has established. So I don't speak from my own establishment. I speak from that that God has established. I went to Arabia. I found crooks. I was raised as a so-called Negro in Chicago. And the Jews I saw were crooks. Tavern owners. Pawn shops. 
stop on it. My people lived under Christian rule for almost four centuries now. And our history is one of the cruelest kind of enslavement that you can read about anywhere. So let's look at the work and judge the doers of that work. I admit that there are some Christians who don't go along with the majority, who never went along with or went along with the majority. I admit that there are some Jews who have never gone along with the majority. And there are Muslims who have never gone along with the majority. But you have to look at the facts. If the minority among the Jews are wicked, then the majority have let the minority come into power. If the majority among the Christians are good, then I say that majority have let a minority come into power. If the majority among Muslims are good, then that majority have let a minority come into power. Now that's the fact. That's the truth. If they speak from their scripture and they preach the truth, then they have to present something that will condemn them for what, for what they have done. I read the Bible, and believe me, I understand it. The Bible from Genesis, and I mean from the very first verse of Genesis, to the end of the book, preach against Deceit, lying, craftiness, greed, murder, enslavement, hypocrisy. These things are condemned from the Genesis to Revelation. Preachers against materialism. The book from Genesis to Revelation goes after the protection of the weak, the unschooled, the deprived. But what have Christian establishment done? They have gone after the weak, the uneducated, the deprived, to put shackles on their arms and on their legs. That's the history behind us. And if it wasn't for us fighting hard and risking our lives every day for the last 40 years or more, we would be in shackles right now. of the earth. The Holy Quran preaches against a monopoly, a holy monopoly of God's truth. But I found email who hold a monopoly on the truth and pass out peanut hulls to the people who come to their mouth to hear them on Friday. Telling you what I've seen, I know what happened. Almighty God wouldn't have picked me before letting me know what was happening. And I don't want you to get spooky. I don't want you to get spooky and think that I'm saying I'm some supernatural being. Or some new Christ. Or new prophet Muhammad. No, I'm nothing but a common person like
like you are. But who, because of his sincerity, God has rewarded that sincerity with more light than he put on any man till this very day. more light than Christ Jesus. There was not a much, as much darkness when Christ Jesus was here. How can you have as much light as the Holy Prophet Muhammad of Arabia? There was not as much darkness when Prophet Muhammad of Arabia was here. The conditions were horrible in the times of those great men. But darkness hadn't covered the whole earth yet. The big old continent, almost a third of the world, hadn't even been discovered yet by that known world of yesterday. So look at all the problems that have come out of human nature and out of human society since Moses, since Jesus, since Muhammad of Arabia. The world has grown as in darkness like something corrupt, something filthy burning, and the dark smoke pouring out. It poured out so much in Moses' day, so much in Jesus' day, so much in Muhammad's day, but today the whole world is polluted, brothers and sisters. I'm not saying that I'm a greater man than any of those. I wouldn't dare say that. I wouldn't dare say that. I'm not saying that I'm a greater man than the last one, the last prophet from God. Muhammad may peace be on him. But I'm saying that light now is bigger and greater than it was in his day. And even the light that he held before the world, the whole Quran, it's bigger today than it was in those days. His knowledge was big. His knowledge was bigger than the knowledge that existed in the world at that time. But Prophet Muhammad of Arabia, he shouldn't, he couldn't, he was not in a position. The conditions hadn't been brought about. He couldn't give the world the whole light that he had received. He only could give the whole Quran. And if you don't have any sense, if you are not divinely inspired, you can read that whole Quran, and when you read it off to me, you might not light up my closet. Let's move the world. Now hold up. It takes some kind of understanding and conditions, experiments, experiment, circumstances, all of these natural things. Work to bring the light out more and more. They and as our understanding grow bigger, our light, our light, our focus, our light grow bigger because our focus has widened to take in more light. Do you understand? The people that Jesus spoke to, they lived in a world, the conditions, the circumstances. The experiments that they had undergone had, were only great enough to open the focus so much to receive so much light. Prophet Muhammad of Arabia, the conditions, the circumstances, the experiments that they had undergone were only great enough to open the focus of Arabia and the leadership of Prophet Muhammad only so much. But today, brothers and sisters, the divine plan is truly universal. It's in universal dimension. For the devil and his hell have went all around the world and have put a lap, has, has, has put a band <laughs> from North Pole to South Pole around the equator. They have covered the earth with hell and confusion. And the people have experienced of hell and confusion all over the world. And now television and all these other modern inventions have focused the whole world scene so that the average man and woman anywhere in the world can look at the whole world picture at, the, at one time. So this has worked to open up the mind, to expand the mind of the country 
to see the light. Whereas yesterday it was too small to see the light. And I said that to explain what I said. I told you that the light that God has sent me with is bigger than any light that shone before from the men before. It's not bigger than the Holy Quran. It's not bigger than the Bible. But it's bigger than the Bible that this world has seen so far. It's bigger than the Holy Quran that this world has seen so far. Do you understand? You know, I know what the people will say. They'll say, he talks a lot, he's a big boaster, but, it, but they're just empty words. The man has, can, can't be compared with Moses and Christ Jesus and Muhammad of Arabia. Well, I've been preaching now for less than almost a year. Go back and look at what Jesus did in one year. Look at what Moses did in one year. Look at what Muhammad of Arabia did in one year. And then come back and answer that person again for me. what I've done with the finished work. I haven't finished. I just got started. And if God blessed me to do all the things that he's shown me, I believe 10 years from today, there'll be great population confessing that this is truly the return of the life of Christ and Muhammad. They will confess that the hope that has been in the people for the return of Christ and for the return of the light of Muhammad as he presented it in his day has been answered in this mission right here in America among the Bilalian community. I believe that the time will come within 10 years that it will be common knowledge that it is confessed high and low that the lost foundation of Islam is the manifestation of the true light of Christ and the true light of Muhammad. Now you just hang around here for 10 more years. Jesus was on the scene, he worked with what was left behind him and with what God had blessed him with. So did Prophet Muhammad of Arabia. Now I have all of them behind me and God has blessed me and inspired me in the same way that he inspired them. To see into darkness and point out what is right and what is wrong. That's the blessing of God that he gives to prophets. 
doesn't only give that blessing to prophets, he gives that blessing to anyone who deserves it. There's not a need for prophets anymore. Prophets come to put light again on the path of God so that people will be able to distinguish the path of God among other paths. Prophets come to show again the way of God when that way is wrong. The Jews lost the way. They got off on the wrong path. They were preaching spiritual teachings, spiritual values, but the path they were walking on was the path of material conquest. They were on the road to manifest as any common tyrant. So God sent Jesus to stop them and take the favor away from them. And Jesus told them that the Son of Man came to the fig tree for fruit. And it had no fruit to offer him. So he said, Cursed be the fig tree. Fig tree was a symbol of Judaism. He said, Cursed be the fig tree. Bear fruit no more. And the book said it right away withered up. Didn't wait. As soon as he spoke it, it was all over. Then right away, the fig tree withered up. Meaning, as soon as Jesus opened his pure mouth and his sincerity was heard, the hypocritical Jewish establishment was finished. They couldn't attract and lead righteous people anymore. They could only keep what they had. That was their materialistic, so-called uh, righteous establishment. They kept their own people, but they didn't win people from the world anymore, did they? They didn't go out preaching in the world anymore like they did before Jesus. Look how Jeremiah preached. How Ezekiel preached. Look how Moses challenged Pharaoh in the name of God. But after Jesus came, we didn't see Jerusalem. We didn't see the Jews out on the world scene, standing up for God. They went into secrecy. They teach their children behind closed doors. They are not seen out in the open inviting people to the way of God and condemning the world for its wrong. Why? Because they know that they had gotten in the top. They had gotten a top seat among those wrongdoers that keep the world miserable. <laughs> and when Jesus condemned them openly, they just couldn't come out no more. So right away, they withered away. Is that right? All right, let's go on with it. You might not be ready to move on where God is moving us, but we got to move on. Pharaoh of Egypt now. 
I have to talk to some of these that have a problem of rusty locks and know all to grease those rusty locks and no key to open it even if they greased it. But the Christian stood up and took the, the, the job, the role from the Jews and began to condemn evil tyrants in the world for oppressing and corrupting the society. The Christians came into power and they fell victim of the same thing that the Jews fell victim of. They got the material wealth and they start oppressing others. Instead of carrying light to those in darkness, they carried slave red to those in darkness. Chained them and kept them back from education and real scriptural meat, divine truth gave the world, that is the general society that accepted Christian rule, the leadership gave them scriptural drunkenness. What do I mean by that? A lot of spirit, but no vision. A lot of spirit, a little intelligence. A lot of spirit, little reasoning and just made the masses of our people drunk in religion. I remember as a child walking through the streets of Chicago and I passed by churches and they really excited me. Sometimes I was frightened by a sudden outburst from a storefront church sound like people were fighting in the place. I'm not making fun. Believe me, I'm very serious. The sound of furniture falling, falling, door slamming, screaming, people jumping up and down. So when I got old enough to go to the church for myself, because when I was little, I, I wouldn't dance my parents could I go to church. When I got in my teens and felt that I could go, and I had excuse then, so well, I'm going fishing. But really, I wasn't going fishing. I wanted to go see for myself what in the hell was going on in those churches. Excuse my language. Excuse my language. But hell is a common word and a condition we all commonly share. So it shouldn't offend anybody. I used to see to see what was hear what was happening, so I wanted to see what was happening. Believe it or not, the first church I went to, I liked to got knocked out. I'm telling you the truth. God let me experience these things for a purpose. I came to this holiness church. I think it was holiness. I tell you who was the preacher. Reverend Robert, Robert's Church. It was, uh, let's see where that church was. It was a bit north in Lou West. I think about 40th Street, somewhere like that. State, I think, if I'm not mistaken. See, it's been some time. In fact, uh, you'd be surprised how old I am. I'm as old as Moses was. Uh, anyway, When I went to this church, before I got in the door, I just got the door almost open, and the door slammed back in my face and almost knocked me out. It didn't hit me, but if it hadn't hit me, I would have been knocked out. Boom! So I opened the door, and there this woman was standing there. Just, <laughs> I said, look, I said, you come to the door again while I'm standing here, and push that door like that. I said, I'm going to really straighten you out. I said, I'm going to knock you down in this floor. And you know what? She sobered up right away. She did. She sobered up right away and went walking. 
walking on up the aisle. But after about 10 or 15 minutes of that doo 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 and drum beating, she got back on the job of stumping and thumping, stumping up and down the aisle, boo and running. And she, I mean, she just got to running. When she got the, the Holy Ghost, it made her just rip and run. And she would open the slam in the door and slam out of the door. So I began observing what was happening in some of these churches. Finally, I got around to the dignified aristocratic church, the cathedral, the Catholic church. And when I went to the Catholic church, I said, this looks like a doggone funeral church. I'm, I'm telling you how the thing impressed me. I've never gone into these places. I wasn't conditioned. <laughs> To, 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 to know what was, what, what, the, what was going on, you see. So I had to identify that thing with something that I already knew about. Nobody had explained it to me. So we walked down these old deathly looking aisles. Girl told me I had to come to the Catholic Church before she would come to the temple with me. So I told her, okay, I wanted to go anyway. Excuse me if I don't fasten this old tight suit. Uh, suit here. I'm going to leave it open, so okay with you. All right. I walked down the aisle with this sister. The priest was standing, speaking an unknown tongue. It was unknown to me. And when I got out, I asked the girl that she understood what she said. She said some of it. And she was being trained. For I don't know what you call it in the church, but she was being trained for some the, the, the what's the boys that carry something? Altar boys, and then there are girls that they train too for something that do little duties in the church or with the with the church. I forget what it was, but she was being trained for something. And uh, <clears throat> he was standing up there with all of his ghostly clothes on. Believe me, I'm not doing this to make fun. I'm doing this to drive a point home. And that is that this world has been nothing much more than darkness and silence. Though they have been making a lot of noise and shining a lot of four false lights. So he was up there with all his ghost clothes on, saying something in Amen. And the pulpit looked like somebody was going to be sacrificed in some black magic ritual. And everybody walked in like it was a death walk. Nobody went in like human beings. They went in. I'm telling you the truth. I'm just describing to you what, what, what was there, you know. They went in like they was doing the death march, you see. And they looked like they had death on their, them on their mind. Maybe all the churches wasn't like that. I don't know. But that's how this one, that's the way this one looked. The atmosphere in this one was deathly. So as we came out, the girl kneeled down. But no, first she put a quarter or something. I can't remember exactly. But I think she put a quarter somewhere. And then she lit a candle. And she said a prayer. And she kneeled before a statue. I don't rem remember whether it was Mary or some saint, but she kneeled before some statue too. I said, look at these pagans, idol worshippers. So that stuck in my mind. Now look, I was, in, I was only about... 13 or 14 years old. That experience stuck in my mind. So finally, I got on the, on the rostrum, pulpit, in the temple. They didn't even recognize us as a religion. But we didn't kneel down to no engraving images. Got on the pulpit, and I began to think about that Catholic church. And I said to myself, 
Ghost people are nothing but cannibals. They are not carrying out the act, but they are going through the ritual of cannibalism. Taking a cracker and biting it, talking about this is the flesh of Christ. Drinking some communal wine, what do you call it? This is the blood of Christ. No wonder they came out with Dracula movies. They got it from the Catholic Church. The idea is they had leaked. They drinking blood, so that Dracula drinks blood. And he has to have his blood. He can't live without his blood. And they have to have their communion. You can't be a Christian without communion. <laughs> Eating crackers and drinking wine that represent flesh and blood. Now, how do you think that's going to affect the mind? No matter how much you love God and righteousness and humanity on the surface, these evils, these cannibalistic concepts, these cannibalistic rituals are going to trickle down through your conscious mind into your subconscious and going to make you act as a devil though you believe yourself to be a saint. Now look at Christian society and see what is there. Cannibalism. I was put in jail for not going to the army. And in jail, I became acquainted with Indians, Sioux and other Indians, up there in Sandstone, Minnesota. And those Indians told me of their way of life that was passed down to them by their fathers. And I saw that their way of life was, very, was much, much, much more decent than the way of life that these people call Christians established for us in this society. Things that are accepted, not even questioned in this society, I found that those Indians looked down on it and take their nose away from it. It was foul and funky smelling in their nose. But this society do it and feel no shame. And the priest won't come before the television and condemn the society. He won't think, make this world, make this country right. I'll be the enemy of the church. No, no. He won't break friendship with the government to correct the society. He tolerates these evils because really he's just there to make a business. He's there to make a business and not to make a world for Almighty God. Well, I can't, so I can't go into some of these things. But I'll just give you a little idea of how the manifestation, how, how you can point out the manifestations of this kind of ritualism that is against decency and against God. What do you think feeds the fire of destruction, racism, and hatred in the Ku Klux Klan is Christianity. They use Christianity to justify the position, the stand that they take. <laughs> when Christians went to Europe, or pardon me, went from Europe to Africa, as it is called, to conquer the Africans and take over their wealth. What do you think they use to justify that wicked march of the conqueror? Christianity. When they left Europe and came here, and saw a need to wipe out the Indians. 
What do you think they used to justify that wicked position they took? Christianity. When they went to Africa and brought you and my mother back here in chains, what do you think they used to justify that wicked act? Christianity. Now, if any of you fat-headed preachers in here today want to challenge me on any point that I've made, when I finish, let me see your ugly pink face. Now, let
to put himself in and to represent himself in. If it's black, it's black divine racism. If it's Caucasian, then it's Caucasian divine racism. God never put his finger on a race and said, that's where I exist. That's where I chose to put myself so that I can speak to the world. He have never done that. As corrupt as the Bible is, by the interpolation and interpretations that have been made by church leadership, still that Bible does not say that. You have to read it again, brothers and sisters. The Bible never say that Jews, as a flesh people, are the favored people of God. Only as long as they follow in the spirit of God, so the book says, are they worthy to be called the children of God. So the book says. And the book has a, has a, a, a lot of verses and chapters showing us how God took his blessing away from one of a certain family and put it on another one of another family. How he took his blessing from one people and gave it to another. All right. And again, he is not God. This is me. Jesus made it plain. Jesus got hungry. Jesus had to eat. Jesus had to be washed. Jesus even had to be baptized by John. And before that, he was circumcised. And the book says that he was educated and made sanctified. That's what the book says of Jesus. The book says that he grew in knowledge. And Jesus didn't say anything to contradict those things in the scripture. Jesus spoke of himself as a common person, as a human being. He says, I don't know everything. I can't tell you what will happen on tomorrow. Only God knows that. And on the cross when he was dying, as the Christian book gives it, he said, oh God, oh God, why have you forsaken me? Letting us know that God ain't dying on this cross. It's only me dying on this cross. Oh God, oh my God, oh my God, why have you forsaken me? Letting the world know that God is not dying on the cross. I'm dying on the cross. Then the Christian church take the body that was not God and put it up before me and you and tell you this is God. This is God's body. God manifests himself on earth in his son Christ. Here he is. Pray to Christ. Did they teach your father and your mother to pray to God, the creator of the heaven and earth? Tell me the truth. They told you to pray to Jesus, didn't they? Call on Jesus. Oh, if you get in trouble, just call on Jesus. Jesus never told anybody, if you get in trouble, call on me. He said, if you get in trouble, call on my heavenly father. That is not only my heavenly father, but it's also your heavenly father. The plan, the plan of making a white body, the vessel 
holy and almighty God was part of the plan to enslave all the darker people of the world. I said all the darker people of the world. Europe came up with Christianity and they saw they had a powerful thing that would give them control over the whole world. They said if we can pull all white people together, so-called white, I don't call them white, this paper is white, snow is white, the Caucasian race is pink, orange, red, blue, pale, they all kind of colors. All right, now, they said if we can get the world all to call us white folk, and show Christ as a white man, if we go into their land and tell them that the Savior of the world is Christ, a white man, they will look at us as Savior, led by divine Savior. They will include us in the holy family, in the divine family. And when they rebel against us, once we get in control over them, if they rebel against us, in, their, in the back of their mind, something will be knocking and holding them back, saying, don't attack the image of God. So they plan to put the white man's image deep in the minds and hearts of all dark people. So that when you rise up, something would trick in your mind and wouldn't even speak clearly to your mind because the trick was so subtle. The trick was so hid that our language wasn't spoken. Only a symbol was given. So when you start to rise up and protect yourself, a message won't come in words. Only a symbol, a signal will come. And you won't even recognize what it is. It will come as a feeling telling you, don't attack master. And that has been the condition of the black world until the light came from the east and sang even unto the west. that was keeping you in the corral. The church teaching is nothing but a corral for the work animals of America to keep your work animals. They design that corral and they use all the teachings that they could possibly out of context. Don't hate those who hate you. Turn the other cheek and pray for those who spitefully use you. If your enemy take your cloak, give him also your what? Yeah, give him your underclothes, your socks and your shoes. And go on and walk away naked. Don't, don't, get, don't get angry. And if your enemy come and ask you to walk a mile with you, what does it say? Don't walk just a mile with him. Walk two miles with him. Now look, that's what our fathers and mothers were fed into their minds and hearts by the church preacher. To keep us quiet, submissive, obedient to wicked, cruel leadership. We want
wonders how come the black community didn't rise up by the thousands and throw stones or sticks to do something when the Caucasian took an innocent one of them and lynched it, set his body afire and burned them alive while they drank and have a party before the burning court. They, they wonder, outside society, they wonder, how come we didn't rebel? They thought the white man's physical might, that his physical weapon, had intimidated us to the extent that we wouldn't move. No, it was not. It was his Christianity that held us in check. We feared that God didn't want us to do that. That we wouldn't be satisfied in Christ if we behaved like that. The greatest chain they put on us was Christ. Let anybody condemn it. Let anybody condemn it. It wasn't the physical chain, brother and sister. The greatest chain that this world ever put on you and me was Jesus Christ. We have to get the truth out. We wanted to be like Jesus. Oh, I've got to talk on. It's getting late, but I'm going to tell you this. We wanted to be like Jesus because they had designed that message to make everybody that had any innocence in them Everybody that had any real sincerity, they would want to be like Jesus. Because Jesus was the ideal human being. So they fed us this Jesus to make us want to be like Jesus. The people that were more uh, uh, susceptible, more open to this bait that they were going to give the world was those who suffered like Jesus suffered. You see? And who are they? They're the poor outcasts. They're the poor rejected people of the world. They wonder how come the Indian wouldn't buy the bait. See, these Indians are poor. They're primitive. But they weren't poor in the sense that we were poor and that many other people over the world were poor. So when they tried to feed this bait to the Indian, the Indian said, no, I don't want it. Take it back home, pale face. They had a hell of a time getting the Indian, the American Indian, to buy Christianity. In fact, even today they don't have them all accepting Christianity. Most of the Indians, they have their own idea about what religion should be or what it is. So they had to wipe them out. That shows you that Christianity was their safeguard. You understand? Any people that wouldn't accept Christianity had to be wiped out because that people wouldn't have a safety. What you call it? Something to hold them in check. Bam. They wouldn't have no safety valve on them, you see. So the Indian, if he didn't accept the church, how could we contain him? How could we judge him? How could we keep him in order? But if we put a safety valve on him, Christianity, the moment he get hot and the steam starts shooting out, say, wait a minute, you're going to bust the valve, and the valve is holy. That's Christ you're about to break. <laughs> to get the Indians to accept it. So they say, we're going to have to kill them out. We're going to have to beat them down, rip them down, cut them down to, to small enough numbers and put them on reservation so that we don't have to worry about them. But the black man of America, they all just keep working on his head and his heart with Jesus. And in time, we can let him integrate. 
because he will be safe. No risk in our society. We can sleep sound at night. The faith of our Jesus Christ will certainly go off if he get out of order. And we won't have to go and adjust, make adjustments to keep the steam down. Good Christian Blackie will do it himself. And that's what our community has been like. The preacher has stood out front, right? Telling us how Americans are supposed to be. How Christians, what Christians are supposed to be. And you are supposed to be Christian folks. We are Christian folks. I don't care what you hear others doing. Remember, you are Christ people. We belong to Jesus.
So I'm telling you this, brothers and sisters. So that if there are some out there who really want to go right, you'll make up your mind today, knowing the truth. Our fathers and mothers, they used to sing a song about the cross. The old emblem, emblem of suffering, shame, and death. Your slave grandparents had more sense than you. They said, someday I hope to change this old cross for a starry crown. They didn't want it. They understood that it was a burden, an evil thing on Jesus. And that Jesus in heaven would not have the cross, but would have a solid crown. And they wanted to one day get rid of the cross and get that solid crown. So if the cross is something that we hope to get rid of, why carry it? Why cherish it? Let me tell you another powerful evil of the cross. Along with this white supremacist power, it also has a power that is death. The cross makes the people who love the cross lose respect for life. They cherish the sign of death and they worship a God that is victorious in the grave. So they begin to subconsciously look to the grave for victory. They even wait to, to, uh, until they reach the grave to repent and stop doing their evil doing. They wait until they feel death coming on. Then they say, go get a priest. I'm ready to confess my sin. They feel that it's not necessary to really get serious about anything until the graveyard door opens up. <laughs> That's right. So believe in Christ. Carry the cross on your neck. And go in brother's bed room tonight and leave with his wife. Go out in the morning to your business and sell liquor to the wine head. Spread alcoholism. But when you feel death coming on you, call the priest. Tell him you're ready to confess. It makes you respect death, love death, and disrespect life, and hate life. Where in the world is life any more disrespected and abused than it is in Christian land, under Christian rule? Look what this government tolerated from the plantation during our captivity, this Christian nation. Look what they tolerate now out there in the street. You got to put yourself in jail to keep people out of your house. Bars all up to your window, you in jail. Right? You got to lock yourself up in jail to keep people out of your house from killing you and taking your goods from you. Is that right? Where else in this world can you go and find people locking themselves up in jail to keep criminals out of their house? I haven't seen that anywhere I've gone and I've been 
to quite a few, few places over this world. I haven't seen any place where people had to lock themselves up in jail to keep the criminal out. That means the public has been taken over by criminals and the good people are already safe in jail. But the 
pollution, corruption, and death. Now, do you think God is going to say, oh, yes, you failed the whole world? You brought racism on the scene. You established white supremacy. You made people conscious of their physical color more than they were conscious of their moral nature. You made people fear to show their black face, but not afraid to show their black, wicked heart. Now, do you think God is going to let a people like that rise again? To rule the world? They don't have a second chance. Anybody that messed up that much don't have a second chance. Not until the whole cycle is completed again. Well, W.B. Muhammad, how in the world are you going to lead this world? What qualifications do you have? The power. The power. That's what I have. Hold up. This world has ruled because there was no power to challenge it. Now God has blessed us with the power. And when we come together as one body, we all share in this power. The power we have can turn wheels over everywhere. We don't have to be the machinery. We are the power. Do you understand? If, if you think that I will have to become China and Arabia and Europe and the United States, then you have the wrong idea of what I'm talking about. Those are only parts in a great machinery. I mean that God is going to give me the power. And the wheels are going to turn by the power that he's going to bless me with. And when I say me, I mean this body. You don't believe it? Live on! Just don't die. And you're going to live to see it. You don't think much is still what I'm teaching you, I guess. 
I know you Christians, you read what I put in the paper. You can't see any value in it that justify you putting down what you got. Well, you're pitiful. You're really pitiful. You rather hold on to the Sunday school, kindergarten, fairy tale presentation than to come into the college of Muhammad. You're pitiful. You think that the, that the masses, that the many uneducated people around you are still so beneath you that you have to keep them with that kind of charity or kindergarten preaching. You're wrong. You're making a big mistake. The people don't come to you to listen and follow what you're saying. Most of them come to you now, preachers, to see you lie. To see how big a lie you're going to tell them this Sunday. They come to see how well the choir can perform this Sunday. I'm telling you what the majority of them are coming to you for now, preacher. They're coming to see just how big a hypocrite you can be. They don't even think you're serious anymore. And they are right. They think that you're an actor. And they're coming to see your act. But you let the community get in trouble, you can't lead them nowhere, preacher. You can't get this community to do nothing. Can't even get your congregation to do anything. If you want your congregation to do something about the problems in your, in your community, you can't get them to act behind you. Because you haven't conditioned them, you haven't qualified them to follow any real leadership. You have conditioned them, qualified them to only be emotional monkeys and clowns under you. That's all you qualified them to do. So when you get in trouble, real trouble in the society, you can't even depend on your congregation. Because they are not really followers. They are spectators. They are there to see you clown. And the proof of that, the biggest clown has the biggest congregation today, don't you? The Catholic Church, what holds it together? Symbol. That's all. The people go to Catholicism because it's a symbol. It's a symbol of well-to-do. It's a symbol of sophistication. It's a symbol of dignity. To so those who've been starving for just a symbol, just a dress of dignity, they wear Catholicism. You better put down it, put it down, brother. Before it's too late. If you come up too late, you're not going to get a place here with us. Not here. You're going to have to sit out there until you perform a divine miracle. I wouldn't 
comes the preacher who see what's going on in this day and time and wait up wait until we get over and he come up here talking about I want to join, I wouldn't trust them to be a chauffeur for us. Let me, uh, I'm going to let you go in a few minutes. But let me, uh, let me point out a few things in the scripture to show you how you are being robbed of real scriptural teaching. I'll start with Genesis. Genesis says, let there be light. The church won't tell you that that means let there be knowledge in the heads of the people. Let the human society grow in knowledge. They make you think it means spiritualism. It means knowledge. Some sense in your head. That's the first commandment. Let the brain grow in intelligence. Let the head be lit with light. That's the first commandment. Because the head is the, is the head. And if there's no light in the head, what can we expect in the body? The head has to rule over the body. Is that right? So the first commandment, let there be light. Let there be intelligence. Do you know the church persecuted education? Persecuted educators? That's what brought on the Renaissance. There was a movement against church leadership. Is that right? The Renaissance was a movement against church leadership. So we wouldn't have this advanced science. We wouldn't have free education, public school, if there hadn't been a, an uprising to overthrow church leadership. Do you understand that? So that's a clear fact in history that tells us that the church did not obey the first letter of the Bible. Let there be light. They knew they were limited, so they felt the only way to keep ourselves on the throne is to keep knowledge from the, from the masses, from the majority. Don't you didn't need any schooling. Don't worry about that. The bishop's son will get the schooling. The priest's son will get the schooling. You subjects, stay in your places. I believe that's described Christianity back in those days. See, we got historians up here. If I go wrong, they can correct me. All right. What else do we find? Coming up from Genesis now. Genesis says that there was two brothers. Tell us there were two brothers. Cain and Abel. Abel was killed by Cain. The church has been preaching this for I don't know how long. But how many of you know what that means? All you know is it means that you shouldn't kill your brother. Is that all? You didn't need God to tell you that. Animals know better than that. In fact, they don't even kill their own kind. They fight each other, but most of animals won't kill their own kind. They kill another kind but not their own kind. So why God had to tell you, don't kill your brother? You go in the jungle where church, religion, and education, civilization have never been. And you will find people back there in the jungle you call primitive. They know in their hearts not to kill their brother. And they don't kill their brother as much as you do over here with all your Jesus Christ. So how many of you have really been taught 
what it means for Cain not to kill Abel. What that means? Cain should not kill Abel. And that if someone killed Cain for killing Abel, his punishment meant to be sevenfold worse than Cain's punishment. This is the beginning of the Bible. You're a Christian. And I don't care where you came from. How many can tell me what it means? I know what they've taught you. They've taught you nothing but Sunday school, kindergarten language. All right, let's come on up some more. If you want me to tell you, I can tell you. You don't have the time today. But in time, I'll tell you. And I challenge the Pope to prove I'm wrong. If he can find anything in his Bible, or in his, in his law, or anything to, con to, to condemn me, other than the lies that they have added, that I can easily dis dispel with a little truth. So he will be disarmed right away. Now, if what he's left with to fight with, if he can condemn me, I'll eat the whole Bible up dry with not a drop of water. And I know that's a hard thing to do, eat all that paper and cardboard. Coming on up in the Bible now, we find that some people went to the city of Nod and took themselves wise from another people. And the book hadn't told us that there were any other people but the people that came from Adam and Eve. Where did these other people come from? Have you been taught that? The old witnesses, they try to teach their people. But most of you haven't been taught anything on that subject. All right, let's come on up a little further now. Sons came from, sons and daughters came from Adam. Called Tubal Cain, Jubal Cain. Daughters called Adar. Have the church told you anything about them? Well, they're very important. In Genesis, they're very important. Very important to Christianity, to anybody who believes in the Bible. But they haven't taught you anything, have they? Even before that, there's a snake in the garden and a forbidden tree and a fruit that you shouldn't eat. What is the forbidden fruit? When I was a boy, most of the people thought it was sex. Thought sex was a forbidden fruit. What is it? Does anybody know here? What is the forbidden fruit? Did the church teach you? An apple. Somebody said an apple. And you've been eating apples all your life. Been a Christian, eating apples all your life. Now let's come up a little more. Moses, being pursued by Pharaoh's army, struck the water and the sea parted. The Red Sea parted, and Moses and his people walked across on dry land. Have the preacher told you what that means? Well, that's all it means, that God had the power to produce that great miracle. Well, you will never convert intelligent people with just that. You need a little bit more than that. Because we don't see any seas parting now. No matter how holy the people are, we don't see the sea opening up and dry, a dry road made in the sea. We don't see things like that happening. Miraculous things take place, but I'm, we haven't seen that one. And I think if, if anything like that was, was possible, not that God can't do it, but he has a better way of doing things than that. 
But if that was the way he do things, does things, pardon me. I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure that as long as we suffered and as much as we cried in the name of Jesus, holding fast to all that we had from the church and from the Bible, that Almighty God would have opened up some dry path for us or would have produced something for us, a bridge or something for us to go up on and walk over America back into a better land. And when the American Christians, the plantation owners, pursued us on that bridge, he would have collapsed it. He, he could have been able to do that for us, right? I would think so. If he did that for the Hebrews that was under, in bondage, and their bondage wasn't as cruel on them as ours was on us, then it seems to me that as hard as our preachers preach in, in, the, in slavery, and as much as we sang praise of God and called on Jesus, that he would have produced a miracle similar to that one for us. The church is satisfied with you, eating the baby language, keeping your mind on kindergarten level so they can continue to rule you and give you nothing of what God has promised in the book. Okay, let's move on up now. Since that's such, such a powerful part of the scripture, so, so powerful that uh, uh, who was that uh, uh, made it? Uh, what was that the producer's name that made this movie? Cesar B. DeMille made the movie, The Ten Commandments, you know. And that was his, his, his pride at peace. The scene showing the separation of the water. When iron is heated to a great degree, it gets red. Pale people, when they get angry, they get red. So the ancient people use red to describe anger, for anger. Water means people. Ask your preacher, he'll tell you that in the Bible, water means people. Red sea means angry people. Moses struck the water means he struck moral justice. He appealed to their moral uh, conscience. And when he appealed to their moral conscience, the angry people backed off and let Moses and his people walk through them. the land, he struck the water. Those people who had moral conscience like they had, he appealed to them. And when he did it, Pharaoh's army said, let, let them go. We shouldn't keep them. Let them go. Pharaoh, he didn't like it. He sent his men out to pursue them, right? And when he and his men went out, they were drowned in the water. What does that mean? That the people stopped them, wouldn't let them pursue Moses and his, and his people. When they came, the ranks closed in again, and they wouldn't let Moses, uh, Pharaoh and his army Pursue Moses and his people. Say, no, let those people go. We, we agreed to let them go. Let them go. They rebelled against Pharaoh. That's what it means. It means that people rebelled against Pharaoh. 
and refused to obey his order after Moses appealed to their conscience, to their moral conscience. It's as simple as that. But if you're still in kindergarten, you don't want to accept that. You like the painted pictures, the fairy tales, <laughs> the make-believe, more than you like reality. Now that's, that's a message worthwhile, isn't it? That's a message worth being in a book, carried by grown up. But if the message is only that God made the sea back up, that's, that's not worthy for me to carry on under my arm. My baby, my four-year-old, all ought to be carrying that. But if God is saying to me that you should trust the moral conscience that exists in the people, it's there. If you don't have no other recourse, then appeal to their moral conscience. And you'll find that people, as, on, as a majority, are morally persuaded. Now, isn't that a fact of life? People, as a majority, are morally persuaded. That's what the book is telling us. And that if we can't get any, 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 any uh, agreement from our rulers, then appeal to the moral conscience of the public. And you'll find that there'll be enough support in the moral conscience of the public to overthrow those wicked rulers. That's what the book is saying. And wicked rulers, they know this, brother and sister. That's why they deny the man who is right and just. In the time when the, uh, they, are, they, they, they have a, a, critical, a critical grip on the masses, they deny the man who's right and just the opportunity to speak to the public. They kill him before they let him speak to the public. Why? Because they know if he gets the opportunity to speak his piece open and clear to the public, he'll get enough support. Because God has not made human beings corrupt. He has made human beings to move when his spirit touches them. And Satan never has the majority. Satan always have a minority. We can move on up through the Bible, relating to you these Sunday school fairy tales, and show you the real social message that's in these stories. And you'll see just how much you've been deprived of real knowledge, divine guidance by your leadership, your church leadership. Now, if you want to go back to them and let them entertain you, you just go on. But I want you to know that you are worth nothing. You are no good. You are not worth anything as a human being. If you are worth anything as a human being, you won't go back in that church and clown with them. You'll go into that church and you'll try to tell them, say, look, you have to change. There's a man in Chicago on Stony Island that have a much more powerful interpretation and presentation of this book than you have, Reverend. You have to change. That's what you would do. But no, if you care more about a pork chop than you do about humanity, if you care more about a wine bottle than you do about a humanity, you care more about your little petty weaknesses than you do about the whole humanity and God, you'll go back to that church and be entertained again and forget all about your visit to the temple. Well, if you do, let me tell you, every time you look in the mirror, you remember that I say you're looking at nothing. So I'm like,
brothers and sisters, you would have to be a brass monkey if you didn't see that you were well taught this afternoon. And I believe, I believe even a brass monkey would stand up and say he was well taught this afternoon. Let's give another warm round of applause to the Honorable W.D. Brown. Great job. If you would be honest with yourself, you would have to say that never in your life have you heard a man speak as the Honorable W.D. Muhammad has spoken. And whether you realize it or not, today you have visited your first lesson in theological knowledge that will actually close the theological seminaries of the world. Brothers and sisters, we are really blessed to have this man in our midst. Now I have a few questions to ask you, and I hope you have the right answer. The first question, how many of you are here at Muhammad's temple today for your first time. May I see your hands, please? Everyone that's here for your first time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, question number two. All those of you who are here today for your first time, and those who are here for your second or third time, who have not yet become a part of this great nation of Islam, the body Christ. I'm speaking now to you. Those who are here for your first, second, or third time, those who have not yet become a registered member of the nation of Islam, this question is Asalaamu Alaikum. Brothers and sisters, you all heard the Honorable Wallace D. Muhammad. And we're going to ask the same questions right here. How many of you are here for your first time, never been to Muhammad's Temple of Islam before? Can I see by the raise of your hands? Please stand up. Please stand up where you are. Please stand up. Please stand up. All praise is due to Allah. All praise is due to Allah. Remain standing. Remain standing. Remain standing where you are, please. We have two more questions that we'd like to ask you. Those of you that are standing, and also if there's any of you that have visited the temple and have not yet accepted this truth, how many of you believe that what you have heard here this afternoon is... Maybe you won't even call them divine names. But when I give them to you, they'll become divine because they'll fall into this divine plan. And we want to make them available not only to us who follow this teaching, we want to make them available to all of our people. And we're setting a deadline for wearing pass me down slave master trademark. I like that word trademark because that's what they were doing. They were trading us. I'll give you one nigga for three barrels of sugar. Yeah, they did that. I got a no count nigga here, I give you for a bushel of corn. They did that, brothers and sisters. God said, get rid of that name that was passed down to you from those slave masters. Christmas next year, 1977, is the deadline. And if we hear on New Year's Eve, that the majority of our people have met that deadline, I will tell my community, our community, 
to have Christmas dinner. We don't believe in the, 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 the Trinitarian doctrine, but I'll ask the believers to join you in a big Christmas dinner. 1977. Because it will really be a time for feasting and rejoicing. Next item under the heading number two, Sisters in MWDC may sell Bilalian newspapers. Right. All praise to so God. We use the word may because we don't want the sisters putting too much burden on them. Not with this, anyway, this project. Uh, and we don't want the sisters disgracing themselves. We don't want to see sisters standing on the corner trying to ask somebody to sell, will they buy a paper? Sister, you don't know what these brothers have to put up with. A thousand of our kind will pass by and look at the brother like he's crazy. Now, we don't want you to be turned down once by anybody because we love and respect our women. And your throne is in the house. You may go outside and perform many great jobs but your throne is at home. And your children is the pride of the whole nation. Especially when you do a good job bringing them up. And believe me, they are the salvation of the nation because what you produce is going to be what we have to live under tomorrow. Prophet Muhammad, peace be on him, he said that paradise is at the feet of the mother. Meaning that a woman, all she has to do to earn paradise is do a good job raising those children who are at her feet. And if she can do a good job raising those children who pull on her apron string and hug on her leg while she's trying to wash pans and do other things, that if she can bring them up, God will certainly give her paradise. So we don't want to rob a work that God has already said will earn you paradise by forcing you to put your time into the street selling Bilalian news. In your normal going about, if you meet people and can pass on a Bilalian news, please do so. Next item under heading number two, Discontinuance of Nation Saving Program at National House. Now you know we have National Savings, Nation Savings, and many of you have a savings book. Now I put out the word a week or more ago now, telling all of you who have savings in this National uh, uh, Nation Savings to be prepared to make withdrawals. I've asked the Secretary of the National Savings to send out a letter to all those who have accounts, asking them to let us know whether they would like to have their savings returned to them directly, and they put them in a bank of their choice, or have their savings transferred to guarantee, guarantee bank, which is a legal pro establishment protected by law, and your account backed up by federal government money. Am I correct? Yes, That's correct. 
that is required of all legal banks. So you wouldn't have to worry about your savings there. And I hate to say you had to worry about them over here. But we did. In fact, all the savings were used up to meet expenses here in number two. It was because there was no organization here, no business organization here, no budget, no control, no even, not even any respect for the hard-earned contribution. A hangover from an from uh, ugly past. I can't condemn every official for what went on. They came into it and they just followed what was accepted. Believe me, it was allowed, but now it's not allowed. It's a new day. I've accepted the responsibility because I know I feel I owe it. I came into the office of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. While he was in the office, he promised you that if you save with the nation, that he wouldn't only return your money, but return you a higher interest on your money. I've given the secretary the goal to return your principal, that is, the amount of money that you've been saving. But we can't return it unless you send in a request yourself with your own signature. You should send your book in. If you don't have your book, if you've lost it, you're going to have to send in the request with your own signature and proper identification. You do that, you can get the principal. What about the interest? Well, if you were not Muslim, I would tell you we have, the interest is coming with the principal. But since you're a Muslim, I'm sure that you can wait until we get in a little better position to return your interest. And we are fastly recovering now. I believe in a few weeks we'll be able to send your interest. And whatever interest that you would do, we are obligated to return it to you, to give it to you, because it's your money. It was promised to you, it's your money. So we have to give you that interest. But as Muslims, I think that you should be willing to wait until the propagation funds got in a little better position. Believe me, if I was a crooked person, It would be pitiful. Because Allah has shown me that to be a crook is really against yourself. I have chose not to be a crook. But there were little, little, you didn't have much protection. In fact, we had no legal authority to set up such a, such a department. So we wanted to ignore it altogether. You'd be in trouble. Since the Army Elijah Muhammad was here, I'm telling you, I'm going to tell you what he would tell you. When you say with the nation, as a Muslim, you should be willing to give to the nation. And the nation needs it this now. <laughs> and that would be it. And you good believers out there, you would accept it. I'm talking about the first generation. If he said, well, we need this money to save the nation. The first generation savers, they would save no grumble. But now that I'm in office, they want every percent. They argue over half a penny, some of them. Who it goes to? That should go to me. Well, we're going to free you by giving you what you do. Then we want you to get the hell away from us.
Go now to heading three, temples to become mosques. You know, in the beginning, the temples were called temples. Then the Honorable Elijah Muhammad changed it to mosque. And in the Bible it says, my house shall be called the house of prayer. And the Prophet Muhammad, he named the places of worship Masjid, and the French spelling uh, of Masjid is Mark. So I think we should go back to calling our places of worship Mark, so we can continue to move on the road toward the desti destination that we are headed for. I'm asking you now to get away from the habit of referring to the places of worship as temple and go back to calling mosque. Universities of Islam will now be called elementary and secondary schools. I know it hurts to call something a elementary and secondary, a secondary, elementary and secondary school that used to be called University of Islam. It hurts, but it's in line with what we are all about. It's in line with what we must do, and we have to do it. We don't want to pretend and lie to the world. If it's an elementary school, it should be called what it is. An elementary school is not a university, it's not a college. If it's a, a high school, a secondary school, it should be called that. It shouldn't be called a college or a university. Islam is universal. The supreme wisdom in Islam is over a college. But we can't call these lessons, these, this, this education that they're getting in our school university and college education when you know that most of the students that leave here can't even pass the test to get into a decent college or university. I'm not criticizing to be criticizing. I'm criticizing to point out our weaknesses so we can get away from it. You know, that should tell us something, brothers and sisters. The reason why our schools haven't been real schools is because we haven't really put a real name on them. We have a false name on them, so it creates a false atmosphere. We think that all we need is a name. Don't you know we've had some teachers that thought that all they needed was to recite the actual facts, the student enrollment, and that that was good enough to let the children go home? They get ready to go out there and get a job as a bank teller, an accountant or something. They lost. Bookkeeper, nothing. Can't even read a test. Let's more do it. Can't read it. All right. We know the condition out there in the world. We don't want that condition here. We know those schools out there in so-called public schools, we know most of them are nothing but sham. We don't want no sham here. We want the real thing. So directors of education, directors of education, minister, pass the word. We're changing the name to elementary and secondary school. Sister Clara Muhammad, elementary and secondary school. Many of you know Sister Clara Muhammad's part in the struggle for open schools for us, to keep the schools open for us. But I'll tell you quickly, if it wasn't for her, we wouldn't have had schools. The school authorities and the police came to our house. I was a very small boy. They told my mother if she didn't put her children in public schools, 
that they were going to put her in jail. My mother began to tremble in her face with anger. Her lips and her jaw were trembling. She shook her face and off her finger and off her face. She said, before I give my children to you, I see them and myself dead. They got the hell away from the door. They got the hell away from the door and never bothered us again. Islam that formerly were called University of Islam. you have done and the unity you have kept there and the progress you have kept 
I hear that last Sunday you had a great meeting, and I pray today you are having a great meeting. In fact, I've already heard that you have over a thousand people out there today in Detroit. So keep your heads up and keep moving forward. You will be known as Wali Muhammad Mark Number One. Sales and office building will be known as Nation of Islam Pioneers building. And it will carry the name of our outstanding pioneers written in gold on a plaque. right in the main entrance so everybody that come in can see it. Salam Restaurant will be closed as a restaurant and will be used as a cultural center. And the name will, is Salam Cultural Center. I have to introduce the next outstanding brother to you, outstanding pioneer, peace be on him. This brother, he was a second father to us. But not only to us, he felt it was his duty to look out after the children of Abu Elijah Muhammad while he was away in jail and on the road, running from enemy. But this brother I'm about to introduce to you now, he also cared about all Muslims. He would go and visit any Muslim that needed his help or was in trouble. He was the, I, I don't think you could find a better person. I've seen him as an old man pulling push cars that looked like a small truck with rope, heavy rope, across his chest, pulling it through the street, pulled it through snow, took the pennies he got off a junk that he sold and gave them to help the weak in our community. I wish we had people like that now. We're going to have them. They're coming. In fact, they're here right now. He was another brother that never made trouble, never complained. But he stood up for truth, stood up for freedom, justice, and equality. When my father was away for how long? I know some of you don't like to hear me say father all the time, but that's what he, that's what I called him more than I called him anything else. And now that he's not here with us in this office, I remember him as father. Um, you remember how many years Brother Baha and Mama was running the temple? Uh, well, Minister James would know, too. Almost 12 years. Sister Claire Muhammad, know about that? Now? Maybe so, but about that long. About 12 years, maybe more. The, cap the chief captain say longer. But I know 12 years. Sister Claire Muhammad, my mother, Brother Ephraim Baha, and a few other outstanding pioneers, some of them right here now. Sister Viola Kareem. And there are others among us, Brother Lester. Minister Lester, where are you? Stand up. Is he here? He, he might, uh, he usually be out. He still goes out teaching. He goes everywhere. 
And he's up in age, too, but you can't tell it. Man's still on the job. But a minister Lester, and there are many, in fact, all the old pioneers, when nobody was sitting down. All of us worked together as one family for life. We worked like we were working for our life, and we worked. Let all the pioneers stand up who've been with us for over 30 years. Stand up. All praises to Allah. Remember, Brother Ephraim Baha. Stand up. Those who remember Brother Ephraim Baha. Look around. Look around and see those who remember Brother Ephraim Baha. That means they've been around here some time. <laughs> All praise this all up. Brother Ephraim Baha. I've talked with him, he used to talk to me, he used to give me fruit and candy. And believe me, we were so hungry sometimes that that fruit and candy almost turned out to be the meal for that day. I remember seeing him myself bring grocery greens. You know? Yeah, bring greens to the house. That's the love that we had in those days. He knew we needed help, he brought the greens and stuff. He was back there, he didn't have any money to pay rent and light and buy a lot of fancy clothes and cars. We didn't have money for that. I don't know how long it was before we got a car. I went with my mother and caught the big red. And it was red then. Talking about street cars. You probably don't even know what I'm talking about. Mother went to stores in different places. She had to go on a street car. There wasn't that many people, Muslims in the temple that had any cars. Just a very few that had cars. So we went on the car, me and my mother, and, and when, she, when she didn't take me, she was taking some of the others. All of us went with her. I said, me and my mother, I'm just talking, you know, I don't mean that I'm the only one who went around with her now. All the children went around with her. But I remember her taking me around with her in the streetcar, that's what it was. Her and Brother E from Baja. She worked as private secretary of all of Elijah Muhammad. Protecting his whereabouts, never letting out secrets. You might not understand this, but believe me, there was one person that she let the secret out to. And it was the one that you would think that she shouldn't ever let it out to. Tell her who she let the secret out to. Me. And I was the smallest one in the house. I'm the only one that would know. And my sister over there, tell them what you did to make me tell you the secret. <laughs> Come on, Sister Elder Muhammad. Some pie. Lemon pie. See, I love lemon pie. <laughs> so she gets chocolate pie. That's what it was. Now we got it. Chocolate pie. See, I love that pie, too. I love both chocolate and lemon. And you know how kids are. They love that soft, sweet stuff, you know, and chocolate custard. And uh, she told me she'd give me some if I told her where me and mama went. Did I tell you? Did I tell you where you went? No, indeed. <laughs> we went to see the army like the Muhammad, but I never told. Couldn't have got it out of me if they killed. And my mother never threatened me. She never said, if you tell, I'll whip you. Never. 
She just told me, don't tell anybody. And that was it. Police couldn't have got it out of me. No, I didn't get the facts. <laughs> property we have bought and it's ours now the people out right now we, we are over there ourselves protecting the property and getting ready to get it cleaned up we're asking the brothers to volunteer so we can save money we used to didn't hire people outside to do everything for us we used to do more for ourselves and save ourselves money enjoyed the spirit of working together and doing things for ourselves so we want to see that spirit come back we want the brothers to volunteer Pitch in, and whatever time you can give, give to put that resident club in shape, because convention day, February 29th, we want it looking beautiful and uh, ready and open so people can go in and see what we got there. We got uh, two blocks of property now. We stretch all the way over there. Allah bless us. So we want to get the resident club ready. And when it gets ready, we want Eat from Baha to be shining on it. It'll be called Eat from Baha Community Center. All praise to Allah. Muhammad's Temple Number Three, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I don't know if many of you remember, but there was a minister who put it on the map. I understand Rabbi Elijah Muhammad really opened the temple there, and Master Farad himself, I believe, visited there. But the one who put it on the map was Minister Saul. I'm going to do it like he did it. Sultan Mahmoud. <laughs> he was a big, strong, powerful looking minister. He looked like a light skinned, uh, what was his name? Jack Johnson. And he would stand up to Rotherham, and let me tell you, he would. He would let the people know he wasn't up there for play. And sometimes they'd get up and register, they'd be shaking a little bit, but they'd register. He said, I don't have any slave names. My name is Suta. pioneers here remember Brother Minister Sue John. Will you stand? Stand up. Those who remember Brother Minister Sue John. All praises to Allah. Very good. Quite a number here remember him. And that's been some time ago. He passed. May peace be on him and on all our great pioneers who have passed from us. Well, temple number three will be known as Sultan Muhammad Moss number three. put up with me until you get ready. 
Malcolm Jabal put number seven on the mark on the map. number seven on the map. They tell me in the judgment you'll get ready for what you've done and you'll be punished for what you haven't done. Well, I'm not here to punish anybody that has passed away, but I have to recognize what they have done. Temple number seven will be known as Moth as Malcolm Shabazz Moth number seven. beginning Friday prayer. This Friday at 1 p.m. we will have Friday prayer here at headquarters. On the location they are as follows. They are as follows. Muhammad Mosque number two. Nation of Islam Pioneers building. That's the sales and office building that has now been renamed and Bilalian News Building. On these three locations, we'll have Friday prayer and service. As you know, it is standard throughout the Muslim world to have service and prayer on Friday. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has been moving us in this direction, and now it's time for me to officially announce that we are having Friday prayer. Jumar prayer, they call it. It's group prayer. to attend, you should attend. You shouldn't put up petty excuses. Let me tell you something. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad, peace be on him, he was questioned and condemned by some, I'm talking about so-called Orthodox Islam, for not having Jumu'ah prayer. Well, let me tell you something that's a secret because you just don't know what's, what, what is, what's going on and haven't been around. They have mops right here in, in, in Chicago. Go to that, your mop. Well, I want to tell them in the world that when we start Juma our prayer, we will have Juma our prayer. And our Jumu'ah prayer service will look like it's alive. It won't look like it's dead. And somebody just coming up every now and then to look at the dead, dead structure. It's a shame. It's a pitiful. I went to the mosque in Gary for Jumu'ah prayer. Couldn't hardly get in. One time I couldn't get in. Nobody even opened the door. Isn't that, that's not funny. One time I got in, the brother who was there, the mayor, he was happy to see us, but he was unprepared. Finally, he got himself together. It looked like he had been sleeping. At Jumar time. I'm not joking. 
Juma time is afternoon. On Friday, the noon prayer is omitted, and Juma prayer is said, means group prayer. Juma means group prayer, congregational prayer, group prayer. And uh, he finally got his head like halfway straight and uh, became aware of why I was there. So he got asked his wife and got getting his children. He tried to get something together so we can have Juma. Nobody coming. This is the headquarters in Gary. Biggest, biggest mob they have in this vicinity. In this area here. To my knowledge, do they have a big one? I don't think so. Gary is the biggest. Friday prayer, no prayer. Now how can a people like that point a finger to Ahmed Elijah Muhammad? who was dealing with the people who just came out of the church, just came off of a, a skid row, just came out of dope den, just came out of jail, have been deprived of all kind of knowledge. How can they point a thing at him and say, your people are not doing what even they weren't doing? Yeah, they should be ashamed of themselves. To tell you the truth, I've been wanting to start Jumar prayer. As soon as I took this position, I wanted to announce we should start Jumar prayer. But I took, went slow because I wanted some of them to stand up and tell me what they were telling the army like Muhammad is about. You don't have Jumar prayer. I'm going to tell them to go to hell. Them, you don't have anything. We have a strong group of people who are ready to make great sacrifices for Allah and truth. So we're going to have Jomah prayers and we're going to put the moth back on the earth. We have uh, Brother Donnell Kareem, who was trained to lead the prayer. Now, I hope he can still do it. I'd like to see him before he gets, before he does it Friday, though, to make sure he can do it. He's never led Friday prayer, but I think I can get with him for a little while and he can get it together. Friday prayer is only two rakats. But you, it is uh, done with also with two speeches, small speeches, that only about five, ten minutes, fifteen minutes. You can go half an hour if you want to, but two small speeches. They're usually done in about ten minutes each. Sometimes as much as a half an hour. Uh, they call it footback or speech. The, uh, one is exalting Allah, and the other one is addressing community needs, addressing community needs, building the spirit of the people to move as one community to solve the problems that we have. So the speech is in two parts like that. Now you see how well balanced Islam is? See in the church they just go all one way all the time. But we have two speeches. Friday prayer, congregational prayer, he must give two speeches. He must glorify Allah to, to get the power that we need, because Allah is our friend. But he also must address the community needs. And this is standard, traditional, started by Muhammad of Arabia. I would say instituted, established by him. It was instituted by him. But it was preached by every prophet. Every true prophet did these things. Maybe not exactly as he did it, but they tended to these needs. And uh, Prophet Muhammad made peace be on him. He organized and established these institutions, worship and what. Savior's Day Convention is, as you know, the 29th of February. So this is our last fourth Sunday until the convention day. All right. So
So, uh, as I told you, whenever I'm here, if, if I'm not out of town somewhere else, I'll be coming out on Sundays. We'll have our regular speakers, but I will also be here on Sundays. So I hope that next Sunday I can uh, preach or teach the mission, the truth, without having to go into extra business. Um, and uh, get back on the job of shedding the light of Islam and truth. Because I feel that that's neglected sometimes. There's much I have to say to you. I haven't had time to get around to some of it because of other problems. Now, brothers and sisters, I'd like to leave you with the words from the Holy Quran. Words that were put in the Holy Quran as a warning to the Arabs and the early Muslims that joined Prophet Muhammad may peace be on him. In the Holy Quran it says that if Allah chooses, he can take his favor off one people and put it on another. And that they will all, that the people who are favored by Allah will only keep his favor for as long as they obey him. Fear and worship and obey him and do the job. So in the Holy Quran, the word came calling for a community to rise up, a special community to rise up out of the general community of people who would be examples, dedicated, out in the front, leaders of the society, to, a, to, a, to assure the society that there would always be true representation of Islam. It says, let there arise out of you a society, some translators translated, a nation, calling to all that is established as good and, and denouncing all that has been proven to be harmful and indecent. They will be the successful ones. This is in the Holy Quran. Let there rise up from you a band of people, a society, a group of people that will call the people to all that is good and denounce openly all that is wrong, that has been established as harmful and indecent for the society says they will be the successful ones. Did the Arabs meet that requisition? Did they fulfill that requisition? They will admit they failed. They have not stood up boldly and called the people to all that is good and denounced all that is bad. Look how long we were over here in bondage. Did we hear their voice? We passed by them in the street. How many of them grabbed our hand and said, Brother, I'll walk with you. Sister, I'll walk with you. How many of them said, Let us help you get back on the road. Let us help you up out of your, out of your pitiful state of condition. We bought groceries from some of them. We bought dry goods from some of them. And they would hardly let us know that they were Muslim. I'm talking about what I know. I grew up here in this city. Look how corrupt the world became. But who stood out front 
and denounce the evils. Honorable Elijah Muhammad, communist, socialist government, oppressed people, they stood up, but what did the great church, the great mosque, what did they do? They kept quiet until they were forced to come out and say something. All right, so the Arabs failed this. A few of them struggled, but most of them failed. So as a whole, they failed. They can't show us a community that fulfills this. All right? What else is written in the Holy Quran about this? It says, Let there be a people, Muslim, hard against the oppressors, the persecutors, the corruptors, but soft with believers. Have anybody fulfilled this requisition? No, indeed. Have we seen Muslims standing out? moving strongly and with force against the oppressors, the corruptors of society? Have we seen Muslims calling in and what they call it like a mother hen, you know? She let down her wings and she bring her fitties in when they need protection. When the weather gets bad or when danger's around. Well, this is the kind of uh, of, of care and concern that the Holy Quran say that the people must have who are going to leave. How many lowered their wings down and told the weak to come under their shelter? All right. So I'm saying to you, because you are the ones that this is addressed to now. The rest have failed. Almighty God in the Holy Quran is speaking to this community now. Let there arise out of you a society calling to all that is established as good and denouncing all that has been proven to be harmful and indecent. They will be the successful ones. I'll leave you with, the, I'll leave you with these words, giving you the greetings of peace, and hoping to be with you again very soon. Assalamu alaikum. around the country, uh, the Chief Minister wants me to announce to all the other temples around the country that the Jumo prayer will not be held there until a person has been approved by Chicago to lead the prayer. So that announcement for this Friday, the beginning of the Jumo prayer, is just for Chicago. Other temples will have to wait until they've had a person approved by Chicago for that purpose. And one other announcement for believers around the country. Uh, dear laborers, the deadline for ordering Valerian newspapers has been changed from Friday, 3 p.m. to Tuesday, 5 p.m. The press will begin printing on Wednesday. The National Secretary's Office will give to the press the amount of papers to print, determined by orders received in the office by Tuesday, 5 p.m. No orders will be processed after Tuesday. In order for your temple's Valerian news order to arrive in Chicago on time, the secretary is responsible for seeing that the order is sent off air mail special delivery Monday morning. If a situation occurs that prevents an order from being sent off Monday morning, it should be sent by Western Union. 
No orders are to be put in regular mail after Monday, 5 p.m. It is the responsibility of each of the laborers to see that these instructions are carried out. It is our desire that the Bilalian News reaches your temple by the weekend. The weekend has been agreed upon as being a better time for the brothers to receive and distribute their quota of papers. Any questions regarding the ordering of Bilalian News should be directed to Brother Wazir Shaw in the nation's secretary's office, uh, area code 312-667-7200. All questions regarding the shipping of the newspapers are to be directed to Brother John Ramadan at the Bilalian News Department, telephone number 312, area code 225-2322. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, brothers and sisters, if you would just give just a couple of minutes, just sort of catch your breath. You've had a big day today. We've had a lot to digest. Just digest it for a couple of minutes to give the chief minister an opportunity to get out of the parking lot, and then we will be dismissed. Yes, ma'am. Don't mind. Assalamu alaikum. In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, peace and blessings be upon his servant and his messenger, Muhammad, forever, I mean. There is no God but Allah. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Well, needless to say, brothers and sisters, we have a matchless leader, teacher, and guide. Let's have a hand for the Honorable Wallace Muhammad. You know, it's one thing to, uh, to read a definition, that is to say, well, the word mujeddid means reviver or one who renews. Okay, it's one thing to have that in your head as a definition, but then to see that, I mean to actually see it and feel it and be affected by it, that's a different experience altogether than just knowing the definition. And we can truly say that the Honorable Wallace D. Muhammad is the Mujeddid. He's reviving Islam and renewing Islam. It's a tremendous experience to be in the pot while he's doing all this stirring. Praises be to Allah. But brothers and sisters, we don't have any desire to uh, test your endurance, but we want to read you a letter that uh, I received from the Honorable Wallace D. Muhammad in regard to the Bilalian News in keeping with the uh, great emphasis that has been put on the paper today by all of those who spoke. It says, Dear Brother Minister, the mission of the Lost Found Nation of Islam in the West is to remake the world in accord with the desire and the intention of Almighty God. In order to accomplish this great task, the people of the world must be remade so that they can naturally grow into the stages of human development that God intends for his creatures. To change the community and to remake the world, we must remake the minds of the individuals who make up the community and the world. This can only be accomplished by delivering the message of truth to them that, they, that we have been blessed to carry from God. The Holy Quran tells those who say that they are believers to be helpers of God, to do the work of God. The greatest helper to us and to our mission is the believer who helps us to do the work that we have been blessed and missioned to do. <clears throat> Excuse me. The greatest helper to us is the one who spreads the word of truth to the people. This can best be done by getting the message in the Muhammad Speaks section of the Bilalian News into every home in the community. As minister, you have, a, you have the primary obligation to properly teach the believers on the importance of selling and distributing the Bilalian news. No longer can you shift the weight and the responsibility of this great work onto the shoulders of the captains and the lieutenants. The sale of Bilalian news is still the number one program of the Nation of Islam and as such is the responsibility of all the temple officials, not just the captain's staff. The officers on the captain's staff will have to answer to the nation's captain for the sale of, of, for the, sale of the newspapers in your area. But as minister, the head of the temple, you will have to answer to this office 
for your temple's performance in the newspaper program. You will, you will not accept, we will not accept the weak excuse that the newspaper program cannot be successful anymore because you cannot use force on the brothers who sell the paper. Such excuses as this are the talk of hypocrites. Our teachings have brought the nation of Islam forward through a time during the past 11 months that was as dangerous a time that anybody of righteous people have ever experienced. Yet, as ministers with whom I have shared those same teachings, you say that you cannot keep the sale of the newspapers up where it was 11, where it was 11, 11 months ago. This proves to us that you do not have the understanding of our teachings to properly represent us. The Savior's Day Convention on February 29th will mark the beginning of our second year in this office of leadership of the Nation of Islam. Since my ministers and the na national laborers have not yet <clears throat> come forward with a goal to reach on the sale of the newspaper, I will set one for us. By June 1st, 1976, I will expect every temple to be selling the same amount of papers that it was selling during its peak 1975 selling period. The nation's secretary will soon inform you of that figure. If you properly do your job as ministers, we should be distributing two million copies of Bilalian News every week by February 26, 1977. Any minister who feels that he cannot help us to reach the above goals should write us immediately. Your brother, W.D. Muhammad. Okay? Now, we read this letter to you so that you could see the importance that the chief minister places on the Bilalian news. And, um, you know, we have no reservations about bringing to you whatever information comes from the Honorable Wallace D. Muhammad because I know that the work that we've done here in Brooklyn since we've been on this post, know what, I don't have to uh, put myself into perspective for you. Everybody here knows where I stand if you've been coming out to the temple. So we're looking for 100% participation from all of the believers. If you believe in the mission of the Honorable Wallace D. Muhammad, and you believe in the value of this message and recognize the effect that it's had on your life in the past 11 months, then you should want to see this paper get into the hands of the people. You should want that. So we're going to continue, like we taught a subject uh, Wednesday on propaganda, dealing with the Bilalian news, and we're going to continue to bring you the type of information that will help you to know the value of the paper and the function of the paper as an organ to spread the teachings of the Honorable Wallace D. Muhammad. So we hope that we can uh, count on your support to give the chief minister what he wants. If, if there are any other temples in the wilderness of North America, any other ministers who will not back, or any other laborers who will not back the chief minister's program, well, we have 2.6 million people here in Brooklyn alone. So he can get the whole 2 million pe papers sold right here in Brooklyn if we back him. So we're not gonna look to see what everybody else is doing. Let's just make up our minds that we're gonna do. So if he wants two million papers, then we'll go after it like he's talking about the 2.6 million people that are here in Brooklyn. All right? All praise is due to Allah. All right, what we want to do at this time, brothers and sisters, the secretary informed us that we fell a little short of the goal that we were shooting for today. So if what we want to do, if the captain will have a brother set up the Bilali news table up front, if everybody would give a minimum of $3, on the, uh, on the charity, then that will cover us as far as the goal that we were trying to reach today. We raised $1,700 in total, and we were trying to reach $2,500. And that was just to be uh, in keeping with our quarterly income, what we need each week in order to reach that $25,000 goal that we have set for the month. So if we can do that as quickly as possible, and the brothers take care of your Bilalian news as quickly as possible, we can be on our way.
Okay, let's, let's take care of the sisters first so they can be dismissed, all right? Let's get as, as many brothers and sisters as you can to write them up. <laughs>